go ahead and begin so that uh, we can get to our special guest at the end, or in the middle. They'll be waiting at 8.30. Uh, so uh, to do that, I will go ahead and start. And uh, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate that. Uh, hopefully, we will continue to build up our audience as we go through uh, various topics. Today, I'm going to highlight three different countries for students that are popular international student applications. The first one is going to be uh, Singapore, and we'll talk a little bit about the Thai admission system, as broad as that is, and then our guests will come on and speak to Hong Kong. So I'll go ahead and start my slides. Thank you so much. So again, these are the three countries that we're going to be highlighting, and uh, we chose these because they're probably the most popular for international students uh, in East Asia and Southeast Asia uh, to apply to universities. They all have international programs, English-based programs, and a mix of career or apprenticeship type of programs as well, vocational. So for those that are looking to go to Singapore, these are just some basic information. It's probably true of every country to some degree. Foreign students will need to apply for a student visa, and you will need to have a health check and a vaccination record sent along with your application if you decide to enroll at a particular institution. And that is uh, something that has come from COVID, etc. But, but how do you say that? Yeah, no worries. Any question? So, again, visa for all applications if you are not a Singaporean student, and a health record. Make sure that you're nice and healthy before you arrive on campus. The first type of school that I will introduce are the polytechnics. Polytechnics provide hands-on, practice-based learning experience within a dynamic and progressive learning environment. Work attachments with industry partners range from six weeks to six months and are also offered as part of the curriculum. Polytechnic graduates who wish to further their studies may be considered for admission based on their diploma qualifications. So polytechnics are somewhat similar to vocational college or community colleges in America. They offer business, fine arts, design, trades, and just digital and architectural foundations. Students that arrive at a polytechnic might not quite have the qualifications for the national universities, or they might want to go into a specialty program. For instance, my daughter wants to be a nurse. They could do nursing at a polytechnic, get their qualification, and then go to another country to get certified to become the nurse in that country, or some other medical Type programs. So for those that have slightly less than amazing grades, polytechnics, if you are interested in Singapore, is a great start. Then you can transfer in to the university. Or if they have the program you want for a four-year program, you can continue and stay at the polytechnic. And these are a list of the five subsidized, government subsidized polytechnic. There are some other private schools or bridge programs, but these are the, the main ones that most students as international students and Singaporeans will also arrive at. Some of them are also connected to the larger public universities. The next type of school are the art and design specific schools. There are also uh, a digital art and design school called DigiPen, it's not listed here. That is a partner program or a, a separate campus from a school in America. So there are some schools from Australia, schools from America, some schools from the UK that also have a campus in Singapore. But those aren't listed here, but they do exist. And they will give a dual degree or a degree that is from the Post institution, it won't say Singapore, it would just say the other institution. DigiPen. So, DigiPen, yeah, D I G I P E N. 
a school uh, in Redmond, Washington, I think. Uh, and they have a campus in Singapore. They have, I believe they have something in Korea as well. But uh, they're very good for game design. That's their main thing. So the two main uh, fine art institutions, or architecture and design art institutions, are LaSalle and Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts. These are also connecting now to something called University of the Arts Singapore. And these will sort of merge together. They will still be their own institution, but these are the pioneering art institutions. They offer a range of publicly funded degrees and diploma programs for visual and performing arts, music, theater, dance, interior design, and fashion design. Singapore's first government-supported private university for the arts is what will be called the University of Arts Singapore. And it's an alliance between these two schools in a new entity. It'll open in 2024, and it will expand the range of programs in arts design, media arts, performing arts, and arts management, as well as other applied arts. So we have a lot of students that are interested in a variety of arts, music, design. One of these schools, or the University of Arts Singapore may be an ideal place to stay close to home, but explore in a, a place that's um, well regarded for their education. And now these are the schools that you might be somewhat familiar with by name. In Singapore, they call them autonomous universities. These are the large publicly funded and sometimes subsidized privately institutions. They offer a variety of courses that cater to different interests and learning needs. There are two types of autonomous universities in Singapore. The first are research intensive universities that are more academic in nature and the applied degree pathway where students receive more hands-on experience and in industry exposure as part of their university education. And then you see a lot of folks know National University of Singapore and within the NUS system, they also have a liberal arts college. It used to be Yale NUS, but that has since closed, and now they have taken it over. So it still exists, but it's called the NUS uh, college, I believe. And then it's essentially the same type of curriculum, but it's no longer affiliated with Yale. You know. So some of these are more for business or social sciences, and we might even have some visitors later um, next year for those. And then at the end is more of an art and design one. They have interesting online offerings for uh, learning about their school and design weeks, and then they put that on uh, so people can watch it from afar and see a view of theirs. And then Nanyang Tech, which is from my East Asian family, is probably the second most applied school in Singapore besides in US. One of the struggles for students internationally that want to go to Singapore is to one of these schools, is it's very difficult to get into because so many people from Singapore and the rest of the world already know Singapore is a great education environment and they will have very high application numbers to the amount of seats. So they can be very rigorous with their application criteria. So I'll explain this chart. Uh, this is because we are a US high school diploma school and we offer some APs. I chose to look at this and we will use NUS as the example. So this is obviously very rigorous. Other schools will not be as hard to complete as far as the uh, prerequisites, but these are from uh, National University of Singapore not specific to a program, just general requirements for AP or US high school diploma. Applicants who will be completing the high school and application in the upcoming year will firstly need a transcript showing your 9th, 10th, 11th, and eventually 12th grade. Then you will need, if you have AP offered at your school, at least five AP courses or an ACT or SAT and three AP courses. So if you've taken the SAT as a student in your 11th grade or your 12th grade, 
you only need to show your testing for three APs. But if you decide not to take an SAT or ACT, you will need to have five courses on your record. Calculus BC, which is one of two calculus courses for AP, is a required subject at NUS. At another school, maybe not. But for National University of Singapore, it is. You can choose to take the remaining AP courses in anything you want based on what your subject area will be. So if it's psychology, maybe you take another science and you take AP psychology. Or if you want to go study uh, something related to journalism, maybe you take an AP English class and some other. But they do want you to have the calculus, probably because it's a research intensive school and they want you to have that math foundation. Another school like the Singapore University of Social Sciences probably won't have calculus as a requirement, but they may have psychology or economics or another type of prerequisite. So these are, are pretty rigorous. Five AP classes plus uh, your, a good grades on your transcript is rigorous, but other schools would be different. So this is just an example um, that a Verso student would need to fulfill. For IB students from my previous school, for NUS, it was like 42 out of 45 to be eligible, not to get in, but uh, because they already have the range of classes, they would just have to have a very high DP score. Okay, so moving out of Singapore now and into Thailand, the first part would be as an international student, getting a student visa, which is probably an easy part to do, and the second half, similar to going to an international school, you might need some sort of medical check. They want something with a chest x-ray, is what I read online. So as you transition from a verso into a, a school in Thailand, you would just get another health check and bring that to the admissions, and they would put that under the record. In Thailand, there's a wide range of types of applications and timelines. Some start as early as October, and some don't end until June. For programs that are more focused on international students, like verso type students, here's an example of some requirements from um, my Idol ICT program. They came to visit us a few months ago, and they gave me a good presentation, so I took this directly from their presentation. For an example of uh, IELTS or TOEFL, you'll need to take some proof of English, and they recommend having higher than a five, which is pretty low. You can, all of us students in Versa will get sixes, sevens, and higher. So that will be easy for a Versa student. If they're taking uh, an SAT, they'll need to have above 400 in each subject of the English language and writing. That part would be just for the English requirement not the overall SAT, but just the English section to get higher than 400, which is also pretty easy for our folks. A Duolingo exam, 80, that's out of 160. And if you have taken an AP English and you got a four or higher, that would also qualify as proof you can do English well at that university. And this is probably standard across most Thai universities. A math, they want to have equal or greater than 600 out of 800. And if you're taking an ACT, it's a 25 overall. Or if you have taken a calculus AB, similar to what Singapore asked for with the BC, and you got a four and above, then you would meet the minimum requirements for that as well. But every school is different or has the potential to be different, but this is just a general range. Then, most applications will ask for an uh, essay, why do you want to come to our program? Statement of purpose is what they call that. And some might be one page long or 500 words or two pages maximum. That's what was listed there. So some of you, if you are from Thailand and you went through this system yourself, if it existed at the time, you might be familiar with TCAS. TCAS is uh, been pretty much nationwide, nationwide applications uh, cycle system that they use. 
Every university has courses in TCAS, and it's only in Thai, uh, but other international students can apply to universities at the same time within TCAS. In portfolio rounds, the portfolio in English for students coming from our environment, not longer than 10 pages. A three minute video presentation in English. Again, this is just for the ICT program at Magnado. So another program might be different, nursing program or IT program somewhere else. But this is specific to our sample university, ICT Magnado. They want to know why they want to study in an IT program or computers and how you will apply that knowledge in the future. The TCAS round two, you need to have a minimum 2.5 out of four GPA. You might be asked to write an essay based on the program that you're applying for. You might need to take an exam or have already taken, say, an AP exam and, and give those results. And you might need your proof of English as well at that time. And these rounds start as early as middle of October and then extend later into the year, as, as you see on the screen, or we will soon. The next rounds for TCAS might require a TGAT, or a Thailand General Aptitude Test, which measures English communication, critical thinking, and the future workforce competencies. And maybe a TPAT, Thailand Professional Aptitude Test, and there are five types of aptitudes for medicine, for arts and music, for science, for technology and engineering, and also architecture or education. So as the rounds move through, they have slightly different potential requirements. We only had one student from our senior class apply in a TCAS system. They applied for an early round in the portfolio round. So I wanted to mention about portfolio. So the word portfolio, if you were an art student, it would be a collection of your art. But the TCAS word portfolio means more like a resume. Tell me all about what you've been doing throughout your high school years. And it matches more with holistic admissions, which we talked about a few months ago, like in North America and other places, and even in Hong Kong. The portfolio round is not much different than that. While art, architecture, and design will ask for more traditional pieces of evidence of their artwork, the portfolio referred to in TCAS, in our example in Mahidong, is a collection of competencies that fits a versatile student pretty well. It would include your in-school and out-of-school activities and things that make up your entire educational journey. from our admission rep from Mahidong. They mentioned as you're filling out this portfolio, make sure you're double checking your grammar, and your spelling, that there's no evidence that uh, of AI use potentially, but that it makes sense for what you're applying for, that you pick the right school. They mentioned an example where they're using the different school's name in their essays. That's probably not a good idea. Make sure it's specific to the school you're applying and make sure that it's catered to the program. If I'm a business student and my major is going to be related to marketing, I shouldn't just say business, I should say marketing so that they know I mean exactly what I'm applying for and not trying to make it fit many applications. Something to think about there. Okay, so at 8.30, we're going to have a mission rep from the University of Hong Kong Polytechnic, Hong Kong Poly. So we do have a couple of minutes. I can answer some questions about Singapore admissions or Thai admissions. Does anybody want to ask a question? Could you share a bit more about the difference between the TCAS group three four, yeah. like Corona admission and direct? Okay. So they have these in a timeline and it goes first the portfolio rounds, and it goes down into TCAS 4. And the qualifications aren't that different, except for the portfolio round, which allows you to submit your after-school activities, your extracurriculars. And that ends by November. And then the people that applied at this time will get their decision maybe within a month or so, depending on the school. 
or sometimes up to January. And then these rounds start later. So the dates here are when they are open for applying to that round, and then they close. But if you are the university, your goal is to fill as many students early so that you don't have to get these students that are the last ones that maybe they didn't get any offers. And the types of admissions are slightly different. As we mentioned, they're asking for more academic and more well-rounded information. But by the end, they're just saying, give me your test scores, we'll give you a test because we have some empty seats. The GPA requirement for the last rounds that are in the summertime are much less. So maybe this is a 2.0 requirement versus a 3.0 or a 2.5 in the middle. So for the universities, they're trying to fit as many students as they can with the early rounds, I encourage you to apply. And then it gets a little easier as you go down, depending on how many seats they have left, because they want to make sure all their seats are filled. But by late summer, it's a little hard for them. And then for many students, especially Verso students, the schools will offer, don't do TCAS, just apply directly to us. And that's where we have had a student want to try that. You can go onto their website as an international student and just fill that out and send the information directly to the program. Usually it's read by one or two professors in that program and maybe an admission officer to make sure it has all the documents. And then they will give them a result. So what I would advise Verso students to do is if they offer apply directly, apply directly. They will give you an offer quickly and they will probably want you as an international student to come there. And these are the, I've heard this directly from the rep from KMIT, KMIT, that was here the other day. We had a session with them, the design school. And they said, don't do TCAS, just apply with us because we'll know Verso now and we'll be able to look you up quite quickly and give you a result faster than going through the main system as an international student. But if you are a Thai student, you may have some barriers to that, but not coming out of person. But if you are from the local school, you may have to go through TCAS and you may have to submit your national exams, but we don't have to do that uh, here at Verso. So you mean, even you with Thai passports, they can do international? They can do TCAS or they can do direct. Yeah, yeah so it, it says international direct admissions, but it could also just be direct admissions more about the education system than the passport. But there may be some other uh, hoops a Thai person would need to jump through that the university would say. But once you're out of the Thai system, they're going to think, this is more like curriculum than it is passport. IB, A-levels, AP. Okay, so I think we're good. Thank you so much for joining us. I would really appreciate it. Um, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and a little bit about Hong Kong Poly and then tell us about what it's like to study in Hong Kong. We appreciate it. Sure. Hi everyone. So uh, I'm Jessica. I'm the senior manager of the Global Engagement Office of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. So basically I have the um, international student recruitment, definitely including the students from Thailand. Uh, well, I would say Thailand is actually one of the major sources um, you know, where our international students come from. We do have uh, quite a good number of students um, you know, from Thai studying in Hong Kong U. Most of them are doing business or engineering degree. So uh, I guess I will just uh, make my uh, you know, introduction of the university very short and simple. But first of all, I would like to cover a little bit about why um, you know, Hong Kong should be a destination um, that you should definitely consider for your kids' uh, you know, uh, early studies. So um, give me a moment and uh, I will you know, open my conference right there. Okay, this is just a very, very, um, you know, very brief introduction because uh, I think I'll, I, I expect more like a Q&A and uh, you know, I can definitely address what you would like to know and uh, instead just going through all the general things. So uh, well, first of all, that point to address why Hong Kong should be a destination for um, undergraduate studies. So uh, I would say, you know, to most of the parents, that probably safety is one of the things. 
the good thing about Hong Kong is that the proximity. Um, we are close to Thailand, not that far away, but the kids can still enjoy their freedom. This is exactly what they want. But sometimes uh, it's very essential they know that uh, they have the family support as well. So um, being close and being a safe city uh, and also an international city um, in Asia, actually it uh, you know, make, makes us a very preferred destination for quite a number of international students um, to come to Hong Kong to study. So if you look at the number of international students studying in Hong Kong, um, even after COVID, in one year alone, um, the city actually is a home to over 21,000 international students. They are doing degrees at different levels. Um, definitely undergraduate study is one of the key programs that they would want to uh, pursue. So uh, Polyu is also very fortunate. We basically utilize all our normal full student admission quota to any students from all over the world. Um, in Hong Kong, every single university, um, I'll say before this current academic year, we all have like twenty percent of our admission quota that we that, that can be used to admit a normal full student. That includes the Chinese students too. And then it, it is totally up to individual universities to decide how many international students they would like to bring in versus how many Chinese students they would like to bring in. So um, I can you know, tell you that basically probably you or even other universities, we end all our students on merit basis. So um, we, will see, we will definitely look at the academic merits and also the non-academic merits of every single applicant and then try to admit as many as possible. So from this year onwards, the government just announced that they would like to double the quota from 20% to 40%. So um, you can expect all universities in Hong Kong, including PolyU, who will be even more aggressive and they will definitely will be more welcoming um, to admit even more students um, from different places. So um, in 2003, PolyU is ranked as number six in the world as the most international university. Of course, rankings, you know, there are fluctuations. So this year, we're still ranking at number 10 in the world. It's still a very high rank. So I think this is one of the indicators um, showing how, you know, how, how strong our commitment to admitting um, international students. Um, another factor that attracts international students to come to Hong Kong to study is that um, the city is actually a home to over 9,000 multinational corporates. That actually paves their career path. Um, you know, after their graduation. So basically, if they come to Hong Kong to study, uh, they got the global job market at the doorstep. So, um, uh, Hong Kong is not a big place, very small. I guess uh, maybe some of the parents visit the Hong Kong before. You can basically spend like three days to tour around the city, and then uh, you, you basically see like, I guess, 90% of, of the city. So, um, it's not a very big place, yes, but we, we are a global education hub. So um, it is a home to world's top 100 universities. There are five universities in this city that are ranked top 100 in the world. Of course, ranking is not everything, but it is still something to um, you know to showcase or, or it, it is something. It's an indicator, I would say, you know, to see how um, how good this university and how reputable this university in academics and also in research. So uh, Columbia has been consistently ranked in the top 100 in the world and then the latest ranking show that uh, we are actually ranking number 65. Um, there are several subjects that we are particularly strong in, especially in business, in engineering and in um, science. So um, well, when, when the international students come to Hong Kong to study, they can also take a part-time job, of course there are some conditions, and then uh, we also offer a big different visa policy that students can gain the permanent residencies after seven years of stay in Hong Kong, including the time they spend in their undergraduate studies. And um, well, I would say that when um, students come to Hong Kong, another good thing is that um, when they graduate, their student visa will be automatically extended upon the you know, graduation to stay in Hong Kong. Okay. So a little background about the uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Other than the rankings, uh, we are now having over 15,000 15, undergraduate students from 45 countries. So we are only talking about the full-time undergraduate. If we also take into account the uh, postgraduate or other students, and then we have student, our uh, student body actually they come from over 70 countries and regions. Um, we use English for everything. Our lectures, our assignments, our exams, they are all conducted in English. Of course, in daily conversation, um, our students, most of the students, they are local and they speak Cantonese. Uh, we speak Cantonese is our native language, and then uh, some of them, they also speak Chinese. Um, English, that would be the most commonly used uh, medium among international students. 
Um, but of course, there are different ethnic groups. I do see students, you know, when they speak Thai. I do other students and they do speak Thai. So in Thailand, there are nine factories in school, um, mainly business, construction, environment, and engineering. The difference between the two uh, faculties is that under construction and environment, you may expect they are focusing on more traditional engineering subjects. For example, like construction, civil engineering, um, uh, men surveying, those kind of subjects. While the engineering faculty, uh, they offer programs like computer science, um, uh, the information security, those are more like uh, I would say relatively new disciplines in engineering. And then we have health and social sciences that offers like radiography, uh, medical laboratory science. In managers faculty, they offer language courses, um, but they study like how neurology is related to language. So it's a, it's a very modern curriculum of language. Science, we have applied physics, uh, we have biological science, and then um, design school, school and also hotel school, I would say that they offer very special programs uh, compared to other sister universities. Um, the design program, they offer different kinds of design, from animation, filmmaking, to media design, interior design. And then the fashion one, they offer fashion design for sure, but they also offer fashion business and fashion and textile. Um, well for the hotel and tourism and management program, and um, they will offer the uh, smart tourism or the traditional, uh, you know, uh, hotel hospitality industry training. So um, let me stay on this side for a while because I want to introduce two uh, dual degree programs. Um, in our university, we, we allow students to do double majors. So that means students can do science and business together, but we also have dual degree. Um, well, where we collaborate with other universities um, you know, in, in another country and then students can get two degrees at the end of their four year undergraduate studies. So the business faculty, they have a dual degree with the Copenhagen Business School in Denmark. So the students will spend the first two years studying global business and logistics in the Hollywood uh, faculty business and then in three year four, then they will study in the Copenhagen Business School. Um, it's a very good program because you can definitely expand your career connection you know, across continents that will definitely prepare students for a global career. And then the other um, two degree program is the Hotel and Tourism Management. So they collaborate with the Model University in Austria. Um, same, you know, very similar character structure. And then um, the student will get a Bachelor of Science in Hospitality degree from our School of Hotel and Tourism Management and also a BBA degree from the uh, Model University. Okay, so um, just a, you know, very quickly go through the curriculum features of Hollywood. What makes us different from other universities in Hong Kong is that we are the first university in Hong Kong to fully integrate work experience in our undergraduate degree what we call the work integrated education. So um, if we put it in layman terms, basically it's guaranteed internship. So every single student, they have to complete a relevant um, internship that is, that is related to their major study before they graduate. This is part of the graduation requirement. This is also one of the ways how we prepare our students for their career. So overall speaking, our students they are very popular uh, among employers and also across different industry. Over 91% of them are engaged in either employment or full-time further studies. Um, if you look at the sector, quite a number of students will go to the administration and management or the engineering sector as well. So it, it's, it actually it totally depends on the student's career interest. So we don't offer any co-op program. We don't like secure a job offer. Um, you know, just, just customize that job for you. It's not like that. But we prepare our students for their um, career opportunities throughout the whole year of undergraduate studies. So um, this guaranteed internship program does not only take place in Hong Kong. Um, in 2021 and 2022, actually we have uh, over 1,200 students. They have their internship in different places around the world. So we have a very strong connection with industry and with employers world. Okay, another thing is the surface learning. This is also part of the graduation requirement. Um, it's more than like um, just opening a course and then you know you go there and then have a five-day volunteer. It's more than like that. It's actually more like a surface leadership. Um, of course, you need to identify the needs of the community and then come up with a project and then discuss with the leaders and execute it. Um, but throughout the whole program, we focus on training our students. First of all, your leadership skill, your teamwork, and uh, um, your awareness of global issues. 
The second thing is uh, we want to keep their feet on the ground. So um, quite quite common to see that you know students nowadays probably they just focus on their mobile phones, such a small screen. But we but we really want to bring our students to different places and make sure they have the chances to interact with people from different cultures and then to serve the community so they know that um, you know they, they are part of the you know, the, the, the global village, so they have the responsibility to be a global citizen as well. Um, so touching on the global exposure, um, of course the exchange network, the, the student exchange is one of the highlights to many students. Um, currently, PolyNew has over 270 exchange partners in over 30 countries. So uh, over 75% of our partners, they are outside um, Asia. So again, it depends on students whether they want to stay in Asia or whether they want to go to another continent for their semester exchange. Um, after getting into PolyU, there are different kinds of grants and financial subsidy for our students to have uh, different kinds of overseas training. Um, some are on you know, a competitive basis, some are not. Basically, every student when they come to PolyU to study, they are guaranteed to have around $10,000 in their pocket. And then they can use this money to uh, you know, support them but to, to try out different overseas program. Okay, and then uh, some, something about the money matters. So this is a very, um, I would say, rough comparison of the tuition fee of uh, PolyU and also other popular destinations. Well, um, I understand that uh, uh, finance may not be a great question to students, but to parents, I thought this is one of the things that we need to take into consideration. Right? So tuition fee constitutes the largest part of uh, the, the expenses that um, students when they go to study abroad. Um, if you compare the tuition fee of PolyU, or even if you compare the tuition fee of other universities in Hong Kong, you will see that we are actually charging a much lower tuition fee compared to most of the popular destinations. Uh, very affordable, but again, we offer very quality education because uh, the, the tuition fee here is an average of our country. Even, even schools that may not be you know, that highly ranked, they are still charge a lot. And then uh, probably you also offer different kinds of scholarship. Um, so we have academic scholarship, we have non-academic scholarship. The, those are the entry scholarship. And don't forget, um, for students studying in Thailand, and then if they come, then the Hong Kong government also have a bilateral scholarship um, that offers to bilateral countries that covers Thailand as well. So um, this is the this year application timeline. We just uh, finished our main round application yesterday. So right now we are at the extended round stage. Every year the timeline is more or less the same. So we start we start um, accepting application in September, and then um, it will end in November. That will be the early round, and then we will go with the main round. And uh, for most of basically all applications who submitted in early round and main round, that's what we will assess. Well, after the main round, then we, when we are at the extended round, the difference is that um, it really depends on the availability of program seats. So some programs, they may not admit students anymore, depends on um, you know, whether they have seats or not. Okay? So um, well, probably you have recognized different kinds of uh, in, uh, you know, the, the, the um, qualification. Um, for that point, for international qualifications, national qualifications, we do accept it. And then, um, okay, this one I just showed the A level. And then the student also need to fulfill the English uh, language uh, proficiency test. So, um, IB English, uh, we accept it. And then the uh, IELTS TOEFL A level English, we all accept it. SAT is optional. Only if the student would like to use SAT to fulfill the English requirement that they have to take. Otherwise, it is not a compulsory component in terms of the admission requirements. Okay. So um, that, that comes to the end of the very brief introduction of the university. And then, uh, these are the social media platforms, and they will also have WhatsApp to you know. I think this is a more convenient way for parents or students to you know raise any queries. But anyway, um, well. Uh, I think that concludes my presentation, and then I'll just open the floor for any questions. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, uh, Hong Kong is, of course, the, the cost of living in Hong Kong is higher than in Thailand. I think this is, uh, you know, beyond that. But it's not unmanageable. So, uh, first of all, all our international students, they are guaranteed to stay in our residential hall in the first year, and then year two, year three, year four, it depends on the student's uh, contribution to the whole activities. So
So uh, we do have students who stay in student halls for four four years if they are active, like uh, because I think it's also one of the philosophies uh, in our education. We don't only want students to study in classroom, okay? So uh, that's why uh, we take into the contribution into hall activities as one of the major concerns um, when we allocate the hall places in year two three. In case the student cannot get their hall place in year two, HallU has a student support scholarship dedicated to international students. So if they are academically you know, good, they actually maintain their academics very well, but for some reason they don't really, uh, they, they can't get the hall place in year two, then that scholarship will kick in and then to help the students finance their study. And then the second thing is that, um, uh, let me show the, let me show the outreach. Okay, so if you look at this table, this table do not only show the uh, tuition fee, actually it also show yeah, the accommodation and also the living expenses. So you will see that the pricing expenses is part about uh, 6,500 US dollars per year. Uh, this includes everything. Okay, this includes everything that they need to spend. But we are talking about more the thing. So if students go to Hong Kong, Disneyland every weekend, then of course the cost will be different, right? But um, actually most of our students, they tend to stay on our campus. You know, we have different catering outlets. Uh, we have, um, even in the hall, they have their own kitchen, they have their own community, so they definitely they can cook um, most of the time in the hall. So that helps save a lot. And even if you, you know, enjoy your three meals in our student canteens, actually we offer very affordable and a wide range of uh, uh, catering choices as well. So uh, we do have a few videos featuring how our students, you know, they can just spend a hundred Hong Kong dollar um, in one day, you know, in our student canteens on our YouTube. So feel free to check it out. I guess uh, most of the students share right, their experience. Um, these are the most valuable resources that um, students and parents can access. And then uh, we try to be very transparent and, and you know, post it online. In terms of the financial study, other than the accommodation and the, um, the, uh, the, the student support scholarship I just mentioned, after getting into PolyU, there are different kinds of scholarship and financial study. So I covered the exchange run when we talk about exchange, but actually when students go to do the surface learning, they have the surface learning leadership scholarship. And then when they do their overseas guarantee internship, there is also another sponsorship and scholarship from the student affairs office, helping students to finance their, uh, you know, their, their global internship. So um, these are some of the examples of, uh, of the post-entry uh, financial support. And from time to time, there are also different post-entry scholarships. Those are only for uh, current undergraduate students, and students will get their emails um, you know, to, uh, to invite them to submit applications. So again, some are merit-based, some are probably they look at other qualities, other than, you know, academics. These are the opportunities that students can definitely utilize to finance their studies, to finance their study. Mm -hmm. If I was a student that was interested in doing this kind of study, we have our regular curriculum that we do projects mm -hmm. and for conferences. Mm -hmm. They have the option to take AP exams. But if I was a student mm -hmm. that didn't want to take APs, would I be eligible to apply at Hong Kong Poly or many Hong Kong universities, or do I have to take those AP courses? So if they don't take AP, they will only have an SAT alone with the high school results? They would have their high school results and potentially an SAT. Would you recommend that if they're not choosing to take AP tests, that they do take an SAT? Uh, well, I would recommend them to take AP tests because uh, even as of now, uh, I can count like most, basically all of the universities in Hong Kong. Um, to recognize what we call a US curriculum, we need the SAT plus um, two to three AP subjects. It depends on individual universities. Some universities, they need three AP subjects or more, okay? Some universities, they need two. So uh, definitely, I would recommend students to take the AP courses. Thank you so much. I'll let me just ask mm -hmm. the parents one more time. Any follow-up question? No? OK, that was very informative. That's what I really appreciate the time. Thank you for uh, starting early with us here. Thank you for having me.
Yeah, feel free to share my contact with the parents, and then uh, I'm happy to be in touch. And then uh, if there is anything that I can further assist, just let me know. You're welcome to stop by next time you're in Bangkok. I will definitely. I miss Bangkok. Okay, thank you, Greg. Thank you. Bye bye.